In 1529, the church tried to stop the import of unwanted books, but the smugglers were tempted by diligence and profit. Tyndale's New Testament was one of those unwanted books that found its way to England. It came in such large numbers that the Bishop Nix of Norwich declared, It is beyond my power, or that of any spiritual man to hinder it now, and if this continues much longer, it will ruin us all. Because of their failure, the bishops had to ask King Henry VIII for help, which led to close cooperations between the church authorities and royal agents. It was the beginning of Tudor monarchs getting involved in the spread of information through writing. Every monarch after Henry handled this in their own way, including his daughter Elizabeth I. Her reign is known to be the golden age of England, a time of prosperity and an increase in the arts. But in reality, it was a mixed era with bad sides as well, which makes us wonder what the spread of information was like in the Elizabethan era and how the government of the Queen coped with this. She had his right hand cut off. Or else she would shut you down. When Elizabeth's mother Anne Boleyn was executed, the young princess was pushed to the side and nobody thought she would ever become queen. But in 5058, she came to the throne and ruled as Queen of England for 44 years. In all this time, she chose not to marry and instead saw herself as married to the country. During this time, she surrounded herself with loyal advisers who helped her keep a close eye on the way information was being spread. In this documentary, we will be looking at the way people shared information at the end of the 16th century. My friend Meryl will be focusing on the people's point of view, while I will be looking through the eyes of Elizabeth and her government to see how they handled this. I am on my way to Meryl to find out more about broadside ballads. They were sheets of paper with information on them. Ballads were big business and circulation may have reached as high as 3 to 4 million in the 16th century. Meryl and I will explore the website of the English Broadside Ballad Archive, where many ballads are showcased. This one is from 1566, and it talks about a monstrous fish that's been found on the east coast of the Netherlands. The picture of the fish looks quite monstrous. Yes, it does. And what about this one? Uh, this one says it's about Queen Elizabeth who has died and it's a welcome for King James. Oh, and this one is about Queen Elizabeth visiting the camp at Tilbury in 1588. Alright. Oh, it also says her name. Oh, yes. And this one also says to the tune of Triumph and Joy. To find out what that means, how exactly these ballads were spread to the public and what the equivalent of these are nowadays, we are meeting with Jane Mulder. Hi! Hi Jane! <laughs> how are you? We're good, how are you? Yeah, we're fine, thank you. Great. Um, so we were just looking at some ballads and we saw at the top of some ballads it says sung to the tune of. Uh, could you explain us a little bit more what this means? Okay, yes, yeah, sure. So basically what would happen is that the ballad sing the ballad writer would set some words to a popular tune of the day. And the tunes would have been really well known. They wouldn't necessarily have been written down and people would have picked up the tunes orally and, and learned them by heart. And, um, and many different ballads would have been set to the most popular tunes of the day, such as Fortune My Foe and Greensleeves then the ballad singer would buy copies of the ballads and then stand in a prominent place, such as a street corner or the marketplace and start singing the ballad. They would get a crowd around them. And then when there was enough of a crowd, they would stop singing and saying, if you want to hear the rest of the story, you've got to buy the ballad. And they would have cost a penny a piece. So affordable by everybody. And so to make it clear, what can we compare them to nowadays? 
Okay, uh, there's no direct comparison. They were a form of entertainment. And I suppose the nearest we've got to it today would be uh, tabloid newspapers or social media. Um, but the Tudors would have got their salacious, salacious news and gossip from these ballads. They were incredibly popular, but then they're, they're not really like the newspapers we have today. And also the printing technique would have been very different. Oh, all right. We'll, uh, we'll look into that a bit more. Thank you very much for your time and helping us further. And uh, have a good day. Thank you very much, Andy. Bye-bye. Bye. After the conversation with Jane, we are left with some questions about how ballads were printed in the 16th century. And that's why I am now on my way to a printing company here in the Netherlands. The printing press was invented before the Tudor era, but it flourished under the reigns of the Tudor monarchs. At this time, information was still being shared mainly through conversation. Although literacy developed more and more together with printing, so it became a normality that people could read, although there are no documents of the exact literacy rates. This is, with everything that's going on in the world, as close as we can get to a 16th century press and as close to how ballads would have been printed then. I watched a professional do it, now I am allowed to try it myself. Let's give it a go! <laughs> So we now got our ballad printed. This particular one is about how conspirators tried to kill Queen Elizabeth. On top it says, to the tune of O oh Man in Desperation. I wonder how ballads would have sounded like in those days. We reached out to Ian Pittaway, a player and researcher of medieval and renaissance music. He is singing another Elizabethan ballad that would give us an idea of how it would have sounded in the 16th century. written about Queen Elizabeth were not a common occurrence, but it did happen. We know of a ballad written by William Birch in the beginning of her reign. It's one of the earliest surviving written praises of her. It's a charming love song between Bessie, a nickname for Elizabeth, and her country. The ballad says, Here is my hand, my dear lover England. I am thine, both by, with mind and heart, forever to endure. Thou mayest be sure, until death us two depart. There is no direct evidence as to whether Queen Elizabeth and her government knew about the ballad, but the ballad does put words into the Queen's mouth, so we can only imagine that it would have had the royal approval. We also know that writers would dedicate their books to Queen Elizabeth. One example of this is John Fox. His famous Book of Martyrs was dedicated to the virtuous, most excellent and noble princess, Queen Elizabeth, something she perhaps would have liked. We do know for a fact that Queen Elizabeth's government was very much aware of the power of the printed works to achieve religious, political and cultural ends. They engaged with the printing press on many levels. 
such as her Privy Council, a group of male advisers to the Queen. They kept a close eye on the ballot trade later on in her reign by preventing any ballots that were disapproved of from circulating. They also saw ballots as a threat. According to Professor Patricia Fummerton, director of the English Broadside Ballad Archive, authorities feared people gathering because it could become revolutionary and cause riots. But ballots were not the only thing that Elizabeth and her government had to stay on top of. We discovered that another way information was being spread was through pamphlets. They were affordable short printed works. Some had fabulous travels, bizarre discoveries, and others were political and meant to influence public opinion. So I am now on my way back to Miral to talk with Dr Paul Voss about what to compare pamphlets to these days. We nowadays uh, read about news online and in newspapers. And do you think uh, the pamphlets of those days were the equivalent of this? Yes and no. Newspapers today have a variety of stories. You'll find health sports, business, politics. Back here, these were battlefield reports. They were eyewitness accounts. They usually focused on one battle or the particular situation in the city of Paris or what the King of Navarre was doing. So they were firsthand factual eyewitness accounts and they went to great lengths to establish credibility, but they were far more limited in scope than what you would think of as a typical newspaper today. So do you then see it as journalism? Yes and no. Again, it was the seeds of journalism. It was early modern journalism. They had the rudimentary information, the desire to tell a narrative. They wanted to get their facts straight. They were presenting information to an English reading public that hungrily consumed these news tidbits. They wanted to know who died, how many soldiers were lost, the conditions of the troops. So it was journalism. It didn't have the double fact checking that we have today and maybe some of the transparency and the credential journalist. But it's as close as we can come in the 1590s in Tudor England to journalism. Yes. So we now know what ballots and pamphlets are exactly. And Elizabeth and her government kept a close eye on the written word. But let's go back a little. So, as I said in the beginning, censorship from the Tudors started with Henry VIII. His main goal was to suppress heresy. But, with different monarchs, the measures kept changing, because of the change from Catholicism to Protestantism. So, when Elizabeth's half-brother Edward VI came to the throne, the restrictions on Protestant writing was lifted. The printers flourished during his reign. But, when half-sister Mary became queen six years later, it decreased by half. But what about Elizabeth? Well, during Elizabeth's reign, it was forbidden to call the Queen a usurper, a tyrant or a heretic. It was also not allowed to write or print prophecies about the Queen. However, censorship was often inconsistent and the punishment could simply be a fine. But in some cases the writer didn't get away as easily. The most well-known example of this is of a man named John Stubbs. In a pamphlet called The Discovery of a Gaping Gulf, he wrote of his disapproval of the suggested marriage between the French Duke of Anjou and Queen Elizabeth herself. On the grounds of seditious slander, she had his right hand cut off. Another way in which Elizabeth and her government controlled what was being written was by having propagandists responding and quoting the arguments of their opponents. But books sometimes would be banned, burned or confiscated as a form of control. Although calling the Queen a tyrant was not the only thing that could get you in trouble. Elizabeth was a Protestant and this hindered Catholics from writing and publishing. People couldn't just publish anything they wanted without being registered. Everything had to go through the stationer's company. In 1557 the company received a royal charter. This privilege was confirmed by Queen Elizabeth when she came to the throne. However, there was always a way around every rule. The people tried to escape the fees, scrutiny and censorship of the stationers. The only problem was that if you wanted to speak up for what you believe in, chances were quite high you would get caught. When Catholic Mary was queen, the Protestant writers had to flee to the Protestant countries, the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany. During her reign, 
the center of the illegal printing lay in a town in Germany called Emden. When you look behind me, far away, you can see Emden. It was here that illegal printed material was packaged in butter barrels and shipped and smuggled into Essex. But when Queen Elizabeth came to the throne, the Protestants that fled to, for example, Emden could return back to their home country, England, because Queen Elizabeth herself was a Protestant. This meant that this time the Catholics had to flee to the Catholic countries, France and Spain, where they could write about Mary Stuart, who they wanted on the throne instead of Elizabeth without receiving punishment. But it wasn't all that terrible. Some printing presses received privileges from Elizabeth's government to print separate works and written works in a limited amount of time. And each Tudor monarch chose their own royal printer. In Elizabeth's time, this was Richard Jugger and John Kerwood. However, it was the theatre that really flourished in the Elizabethan era, and that's why we're now at the Shakespeare Theatre. Elizabeth was a patron of the arts. Many special theatre buildings were built and many people came to watch the performances. During this time, Shakespeare, Marlowe and Spencer wrote their famous poems and plays. But Elizabeth and her government did have a say in what was being performed. They controlled the theatre through the Master of Revels, a position which already existed as someone who organised court entertainment, but now had the new task of making sure any unwanted scenes would never show up in a play. Any play had to go past the Master of Revels. William Shakespeare himself even got in trouble once for adding a scene which the Queen was very unimpressed with. This particular scene is in the play Richard II. In it, the king is deposed and convinced to give up his power. The reason Queen Elizabeth didn't like this part was because of the parallel between herself and Richard. So him resigning his throne would have been dangerous to stage because it would have been taken as an insult on the crown. This play was allowed to be performed without the scene, unlike the Isle of Dogs. The play written by Thomas Nash and Ben Jonson was wiped and no copy exists. It was seen as slanderous and seditious by the Privy Council and was therefore not allowed to be performed. Playwright Johnson was imprisoned, but Nash was able to flee the country. Although plays and scenes were repressed, there were also plays in favour of the Queen. Henry V is such a play. The pro-English patriotic play pointed out the importance of having an English monarch rule over England. It was therefore pro-Elizabethan. But what was the effect for the playwrights and playhouses? To put it simply, if your play didn't make it past the censors, you wouldn't get any money. Your play couldn't be slanderous and you had to be careful when commenting about current events. So you couldn't be completely creative and write about anything that you wanted. You had to please the Queen to stay in business, or else she would shut you down. Shakespeare himself understood this very well and put messages of support and loyalty to the crown in his place. This was certainly not the case for the Isle of the Dogs, which is an example of what you mustn't do if you don't want to be imprisoned. So, earlier, when I said that you had to be careful when commenting on current events, that doesn't mean the place didn't reflect what the people were thinking at the time. But you wouldn't get your daily dose of news at the theatre. What did happen was that, for example, Shakespeare would include snippets of ballads into his plays. They were these catchy songs that everybody knew. So with these songs, Shakespeare could make political commentary. While playwrights had to please the Queen with their play to stay in business, painters had to do the same with their work. Elizabeth had artists use models to create this iconic image of her. Even though Elizabeth was getting older, the paintings still showed the amazing young-looking Queen. The 
This was not the only way in which Elizabeth tried to present herself in the best way. In August 1588, she visited the troops at Tilbury when they were fighting the Spanish Armada. She gave the troop a speech in which she supposedly said, I may have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England too. She also gave a speech at the end of her reign to Parliament called the Golden Speech. In it she talks about her love for her country and subjects. As this was a formal event, there were scribes writing down what the Queen was saying. All the experts we talked to about the Golden Speech said that although the Queen was speaking from her heart, she knew very well what she was saying. She was trained in her rhetoric and was very good at public speaking. It was a way of presenting herself the way she wanted to to her people. So we now know that information was mainly being spread through ballads and pamphlets, but that you could also learn a thing or two in the theatre. And we learned that the government of Elizabeth coped with this by using, for example, the Stationers' Company and the Master of Revels to keep a close eye on the spread of information. <laughs>